I think we'll be, hopefully, uh, we may have a few more people as well join us later, but I'm sure they'll catch up. Hello and welcome to today's webinar, uh, where we will be discussing how we can enrich education. My name is Hannah Stolton. I'm the Chief Executive here at Governors for Schools. I'm also a Chair of Governors at a primary school, so listening in with that hat on as well. Uh, we will be recording this session and it will be viewable after the, uh, after the webinar, so we'll send that out in a link after the event. Please do feel free to share it with your boards um, and we'll, we'll share links and things like that as well uh, as they come up in the conversation. We are very fortunate to be joined by four panellists today and I'll be introducing them shortly, but a warm welcome to them and thank you for joining us. So the reason we, we're running this webinar is part of our All Pupils Every Ambition campaign, which is to look at how we can encourage more people to become involved in governance uh, and really ensure that all pupils are meeting their potential. As we know, the school sector is currently working hard to meet the needs of pupils across the country, to fit the learning that is needed into the time that's available to them, and to ensure that all pupils are catching up to where they need to be in order to attain all that is possible. In England, we've just had the recent white paper um, outlining ambitious targets for 2030, that 90% of all pupils need to meet age-related expectations by the end of year six, and that an average of grade five for English language and maths GCSE needs to be achieved. With the national professional qualifications um, announced, especially, uh, especially the one for literacy, the focus is very much on ensuring that all pupils achieve in the core subjects, and rightly so, I'm sure we'd all agree. However, um, we also want to think about the wider curriculum, and that's what something, something that schools across England and Wales have been looking at recently, looking at curriculum and how they're developing it to make sure it meets the needs of all pupils. So those wider learning um, opportunities and experiences that schools provide, soft skills, the cultural enrichment and the character development, that's what we're going to be talking about today. We're putting a big ask on schools not to lose sight of these areas. And I think it's, it's a lot for them to take on. Um, and how do we as governors ensure that things are going to plan and, and schools are delivering what we want to do? So that's what we're going to discuss today. Um, and our speakers, we're very fortunate to be joined by Adrian McLean. Adrian has 20 years teaching experience with 11 at a senior leadership level. And he was a former head teacher, or he's a former head teacher, and he's also a trustee at Governors for Schools. Adrian currently leads on character and personal development at a multi-academy trust. He's a vice chair of governors at a school in West Midlands, and he's recently been appointed as ambassador for character from the Jubilee Centre for Character and Virtues. So thank you for joining us, Adrian. Uh, we also have Tony Camarilli who, from True Education Partnerships joining us today. True Education Partnerships provide international exchanges for schools. They support schools to take advantage of the new Turing scheme, which you may well have heard of. It's replacing the Erasmus program that was in place before. Uh, True Education Partnerships focus on secondary schools and her organization has a wide range of offerings for schools, including the Global Schools Alliance program. That platform enables schools to connect in a safe way with like-minded educators and schools across the globe to enable exchanges and cross-cultural learning. Uh, True Education Partnership also provides a wealth of free learning opportunities for school leaders through their CPD resources. Thanks for joining us, Tony. Sophie Bartlett has joining us from Yes Teachers. Yes Teachers is a charity that looks to address the disparity around the extracurricular opportunities that are available for young people, looking at, in particular, socio-economic disadvantage. Um, we know that many young people cannot reach their full potential due to a lack of confidence or lack of skills in this area. And Yes Futures offer, um, offers a range of programmes to help this. So for two programmes, one at primary level and one at secondary. The primary level programme is aimed at transition between for years five and six um, students, moving them into successful um, transition to secondary school. And then they run a programme for secondary schools, which is a year long enrichment programme to help students gain success in terms of soft skill development. Also a lot of wellbeing resources and home learning resources on their site for free. Finally, uh, last but not least, we have Steve Edmonds from the National Governance Association. Steve is the Director of Advice and Guidance at the NDA, uh, which is a membership organisation for governors, trustees and clerks of state schools. I'm sure most, most of you are aware of the great work that the NDA does. Uh, National Governance Association has 
several guides for governing boards around how cultural education contributes to a broad and balanced curriculum. We'll provide links to those later um, and how governing boards can have influence in that area. So that the guides cover different aspects of the curriculum, including the arts, drama, dance, music, things like that. They're all available in the NDA Knowledge Centre. So thank you to our panellists for joining us. We have had some questions come in in advance from the audience and look forward to hearing questions from anybody who's in the audience today uh, that you would like to put to the panel. We'll start off with one of the questions that came in in advance and this, this is around enrichment. So as governing boards, I'm sure we're all looking at the gap uh, between those who are achieving and those that aren't getting there, looking at that really closely, but are we also focusing on enrichment? So my first question is to Tony, why do you believe it is so important that enrichment is part of our education system? Thank you, Hannah. Thank you for the introduction. I, I don't want to correct you, but basically we, we are primary and secondary, not just secondary. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> so, I just, so obviously we want to help and support everybody. Brilliant. Um, again, enrichment, to me, enrichment should be part of the curriculum. I don't like to call it an add-on. Um, I think, again, it's so important to develop 21st century skills at the moment. I think that's one thing the, the pandemic has proved us um, is that we do need a little bit of a reshuffle. Basically, basically look at the skills that students are learning now and why they're learning them, how they're learning them. That's given us a little bit of a, an opportunity to, to review how we deliver education. So to me, it's not necessarily an enrichment. It's just a tweak of what we're already delivering. Uh, with, it, with it to me, I, obviously we we are very much global focused. I think having a global and an international focus is important to create global citizens, created for a global society that's out there now. Thanks, Tony. Um, so thinking about that 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 um, that offering that we want schools to provide, Adrian, what does an enriched education look like to you? And do you think governors are focusing on it enough? Uh, wow, that's a great question. Um, I'm going to try and answer that from both sides of the fence so one as a, an education leader and, and also one as a governor um, it's about giving children the opportunities to develop themselves as a whole and not just focused on the academic subjects getting to targets in an academic way so what we've got at the moment as you quite rightly alluded to is that we've got a government that's saying that we need to get to these minimum levels of standards by 2030 and that puts the fear of God essentially into a lot of schools and leaders. So the first thing that goes are those activities whereby we can't actually tangibly measure the impact. So mm. what am I talking about there? So kids that are participating in, in sports and in events for the enjoyment, for the love, for the ones, the, the things that will build on skills that they might not use during our time with us in school. So the kind of things I'm talking about are just an interest in art as an example, an interest in music and developing that love for that that makes them become a lifelong learner and appreciate uh, someone who appreciates those things when they go on to into adulthood. We don't know what the journey holds for, for our young people, particularly in the world we live in now. Um, and most of the jobs that our young people who are in school currently, the, the, the jobs don't exist. The jobs that they'll do don't exist yet. So we have to foster uh, skills and a love of a different, different things outside of your traditional subjects for them to be able to um, be prepared for that future. If I think about that from my governance hat, there's lots of stuff going on in schools and we don't always intentionally record it. And, and I think that that's, that's the key to it. There's lots of amazing things that our staff are doing and that our children have access to. And I think it's really about the first thing is like taking a step back as, as governors and asking our schools, what do we do well that's not in the national curriculum that is dictated that we have to do? What are the things that we do well, first of all? Second of all, what are the things that our children and our school community is interested in? Because that's where we need to probably go next. So that we'll try to just summarize that. that. That would be what I would say. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to come to Steve now because that's interesting talking about the tangible impact and, and how we measure, measure what's going on. Steve, how would you suggest the impact of enrichment is monitored specifically as a governing board? OK, I, well, great to be here uh, and thank you for, for asking me to be part of, the, part of this really important conversation. I think um, 
from from a governing perspective and just following on from what adrian said i think it's really important to view this through through first principles um governors often um feel that actually uh, the curriculum is an area that they have to sort of tread carefully around because it, it it brings them into the operational sphere and you know you, but that's not the case you don't have to get into the pedagogical weeds of uh, of teaching and learning to make a really important contribution here so you know I'd, you know I'd make that point to everybody who's who's tuning in that we really don't appreciate the powerful and unique position we are in as, as governors and trustees to influence and advocate for a strong, broad and balanced and enriched curriculum like Adrian was was just talking about. So, you know, the, the, the real sort of first principle advice I would give to, to any, any board member really is to um, find out as much as you can about your school's curriculum um and the best way of doing that you know clearly is by you know getting to grips with your own curriculum principles and policy and 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 having conversations about what that actually means how your school is going about um helping your pupils for achieve their full potential leave ha lead happy and fulfilled lives and make a contribution to the world you know actually how does how does your curriculum principles you know reconcile with that you know that broad objective uh, experience lessons and school events talk you know talk to staff about you know how they you know aspire to, to deliver that and then advocate for for the curriculum to be i use the the phrase hardwired into your strategic conversations you know whether they take place at board meetings curriculum committee meetings strategy days themed visits whatever they may be ensure that that you know that the curriculum is never too far from those strategic conversations about what you want to achieve uh, for your pupils and how you're going to help them uh, lead happy and fulfilled lives and achieve their full potential. That would be my starter advice. Thanks, Steve. Really good advice. I'm sure we'll, we'll take that away. Um, Sophie, leading on from that, if we're going in and we're doing those monitoring visits and, and having those conversations, do you think we're going to see where, where are we at with our school system? What are we going to see um, in terms of enrichment? Is it there yet or is there still a way to go? What should we expect? Yeah, so I think there is in nearly every school across the country, there's a lot of really brilliant stuff happening in the enrichment space. Um, I think we are making a lot of great progress in this area. Um, do I think there's more we could do? Yes, but I'm probably always going to say that and um, there's always more we could be doing. Um, I think Adrian made a really good point and I think a lot of this is about recognising and joining up a lot of the things that are already happening in schools. Every school will have different clubs, different activities, different things going on and actually a lot of this is bringing that together, is finding some kind of coherence to it and is supporting schools, teachers and students to recognise the skills and the development that are coming out of different activities. Um, to give an example, I'm sure lots of schools have got sports days coming up over the next few weeks as we're approaching the end of summer term. So many kids that might struggle academically at school may well excel through sports or, you know, other activities like that. So what is the school doing to ensure that achievements, positivity that's coming out of a sports day, for example, are then really embedded and celebrated back throughout the rest of the school. So it's seeing these enrichment things, I think, as Tony said, this isn't an add on. These aren't extras. This is part of the bread and butter that's threaded through the kind of school curriculum. So how can we really consistently be reflecting back on what young people are achieving through those enrichment activities and building that back into the everyday of the curriculum? Um, and I think that's where it's a kind of it's a quick win for schools. We're not asking, not suggesting that you do loads of extra new stuff. It's just making sure that that is kind of threaded together. And I think that's where governors can really provide some kind of accountability is by asking those questions, is by challenging kind of how that how that learning, how those achievements are embedded for students back in school following these more exciting opportunities. Excellent, thank you. I think one of the things that's come up time and time again is how governors can support with teacher wellbeing, obviously really, really important to us as an organisation, um, and managing that sort of 
teachers support staff um, workload against adding potentially more to, to what, what's expected of them. Is there any sort of advice that you, any of you would like to give on that front about what we could be monitoring on, on the teacher wellbeing front? Um, Anyone like to go I'll have to jump in as well. Um, my first suggestion would be to ask your teachers what they want. Um, lots of leaders with the very best of intentions plan all sorts of great sounding well-being things but actually it just might be a little bit misjudged in terms of what teachers actually want um, you know you might think that doing a day of all sorts of well-being activities on an inset might be great for teachers but actually they might have preferred to use that time elsewhere so I think it will be different in every single school each school will have their own challenges I think it's brilliant if governors are asking questions about teacher well-being we know it's so important at the moment but I think the best people to answer that question are probably your own teachers in the schools that you're working with thanks Steve did you want to come in yeah, well, I, I, I couldn't agree with couldn't agree with that more. I think um, I, we, again, I think as governors, we should be um, very mindful and aware of industries being created that aren't uh, that aren't linked and, and uh, to you know to what we genuinely want to achieve and don't have you know the the, the potential impact uh, that that we'd like to see. And, and as Sophie's just said, you know the best. Uh, way to sort of um, you know assess that is by is by being in discovery mode. You know, having conversations, making the most of those opportunities. You get to talk to staff uh, and really unpick and understand um, how uh, their approach and uh, you know the, the framework for you know delivering a, a broad, balanced, and enriched curriculum is actually uh, ensuring that though, you know, the needs of all pupils are being met at the same time as in, in, you know, ensuring that it's not creating unnecessary you know, workload burdens. And you know, so that, that's really important um, mm -hmm. you know, because we have those opportunities to, to, to play back those conversations with our school leaders uh, in, a, in a solution focused way. Um, and you know, that's again, is, is a unique, opportunity that we have that you know others don't in the system thank you tony did you want to come in yet yeah i just wanted to say that um as a school is a team so i think basically everybody needs to work together everyone is differently when they work together but i think what we need and for, especially for governors and senior leadership is to have a shared vision get get the input from the teachers we've all got to work together but if you have a shared vision and the shared priorities i think then everyone's on the same page and, and they sort of support each other because everybody has different ways of doing things but i think uh, you know it's just making sure everyone's aware of the vision and the aims of the school sometimes you know if you say to you what's your school's vision the teachers don't know <laughs> it's, yeah. it's nice to come together to work as a team because i'd like say if you haven't got happy teachers they can't teach well. It just reflects on everything. So I think you, your staff are the, the biggest asset you've got in a school. Excellent. Adrian, did you want to? Add yes, your please. Yeah. Um, what, what everybody else has said is absolutely brilliant. Uh, what, what I'd like to add onto that is that it comes back to what what Tony was just saying, really, it, it, as the core thing. What are your what is your vision and what is your school's mission to do? And and bringing that back to the centre. Mm. Workload is massively, massively important. And sometimes, as um, Sophie articulated earlier, leaders put things in the way that just are, are doing stuff for doing stuff's sake. Um, and by, uh, from our role as governors, it's about stripping all of that back and going back to what is our vision, what is our mission, and what are our values? And if it doesn't meet those things, why are we doing them? And and just really challenging our leaders and supporting them to make sure that they make those decisions that make sure that our young people get what they need, our staff get what they need. And then, well, first of all, our staff get what they need because that way then our children will get what they need. Thank you. Thinking about um, making sure that those, those enrich enrichment opportunities are available to all pupils. I know as a school, we're running lots of intervention programs at the moment, I'm sure most schools are doing the same. How do we make sure that all of the opportunities that we want our children to be accessing and our pupils to be accessing are available to everybody and, and not uh, including those children or pupils who may be being taken out for additional support or help? Sophie, did you want to come in? I know that's something that you're quite passionate about. <laughs> Yeah, of course. Thank you, Hannah. Um, 
yeah, it's much easier to plan a strategy for support enrichment for the easier to reach students. Um, and we all know within our schools, there will be children that are struggling to engage a little bit more in general. Um, so I think it's, you know, as all schools will be doing as part of their pupil premium strategy anyway, it's understanding as far as we can, what are the reasons for students struggling to engage? Um, if they're financially based reasons, then I know a lot of schools kind of ring fence a little pot of their pupil premium funding to financially support young people to go on trips or whatever it might be. And I think that's really important to have that available for those young people. Um, I think it's also looking at the types of activities that you offer. Um, I think sometimes our definition of cultural capital can sometimes be, sometimes come with a little bit of a middle class lens. Um, and actually, are the opportunities that we're offering as a school diverse? Do they meet the kind of range of young people that we have in our school? Are the activities the kind of things that the kids want to do? Um, and actually, I think that can sometimes go a long way towards engaging some of those young people that are a little bit harder to reach. Um, and yeah, talking about pupil premium funding, I think it's really making sure that if we're you know we're saying that this stuff is really important which we are um it's making sure that we're putting our money where our mouth is and we're ring fencing part of our people premium funding to support that enrichment alongside the academic stuff which is also important um but i think it's really yeah it's critical that some of your people premium funding is going towards these enrichment opportunities as well that leads on very nicely to one of the questions that we had um from camilla around budgets are tight at the moment how do we make sure that all pupils are able to access and, and I guess not just people premium it might it might be other pupils as well times are tough so how do we make sure that that our budgets are um is there any clever things that we can be doing I suppose as a school to to um to ensure that all of those opportunities are available Steve did you want to come in on that oh well, that's 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 a difficult question to to answer mm -hmm. with because, because every school has its own funding experience I mean I absolutely don't want to downplay the huge you know, challenges that schools face in, in this space. Uh, I think generally um, there, there, are, there are two two things I think we can we can focus on here. First, you know, Adrian has already said, you know, uh, focus on on our strategic priorities and what's important. And if we do have a, a clear vision and um, clearly clear strategic priorities, um, then that lends itself uh, it doesn't make it you know less challenging but it lends itself to better resource allocation decisions and, mm -hmm. and 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 smarter resourcing through disciplines like integrated curriculum and financial planning for example so that's the first thing and the second thing I, i'm sure my colleagues on a panel will agree is it is is being mindful of, of of the benefits and the power that you can harness through collaboration in whatever context and there's a range of views on, 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 you know, what the best form of collaboration is. You know, we could have a you know, separate hour on the white paper <laughs> and the school yeah. system. But the, the but the, in, you know, the principle of schools working together for the benefit of their pupils and their communities and harnessing that power also brings advantages uh, potentially in terms of um, you know resort, you know, spreading spreading what is you know thin, thin resources that that much better and smarter. Uh, for this, you know, for this intention. Thank you. Adrian, did you want to add something? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, building on what, what Steve says, um, because they are the building blocks. Um, I'm, I'm going to take it to, to the next level. If you've already done all of those things and you're still thinking, where are we going to get some funds from? So one of the things that's part of my 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 day job role is is actually to implement our pledge to, to our, our, our children across our primary and secondary schools. And that involves an enriched education that means that they get lots of opportunities. It's not opportunities that they get to opt into. It's what we will provide them with. It's not a case of that you need to pay to get into this. You're going to receive these as part of your education with us. So one of the things that I do quite often is, is I look to the community. What can we do with our community that is around us? How can we get them involved to be invested in our young people? and to make sure that they know that they can contribute to the development of them. Um, you know, there's a very famous African proverb that says it, it, takes, it takes a village to raise a child. 
that's what we're talking about here. It's not just down to schools, it's down to all of us in the community. So I spend a lot of time talking to businesses and organizations that run stuff. Can What can you support us with? How can you help us? There are lots of foundations out there, lots of charitable foundations out there who can provide opportunities. We just need to know who they are. So we need to just go and trawl and find out what's available to us and how we can access them. Thank you. That links really nicely with a question from Keith that came in around um, using governors' experience outside of outside of their governor role. So that there are different interests and skills which they may have that um, aren't exploited, may potentially to the to the most that it could be. Um, perhaps there are co-opted governors who have experience or life learning experience, life learning skills from their own work and career. Um, his question is, with an understanding that as governors our roles are strategic, so touching on what you were saying, Steve, um, what process is desirable for schools and authorities or trusts to exploit the latent resource of the experience of governors to enrich children's knowledge of, um, of what's to come for their future and, and also what's out there? I guess. Tony, did you want to have anything on that? Uh, again, I think, like I say, it's it's connected. It is networking, isn't it? I say that there are, there's a wealth of experience of us adults can share to students, even if it's just life. It doesn't even have to be your experience in business. It's how you cope with, with society and life nowadays. Um, but yes, as long as it's sort of inclusive, I said, yeah, I, I love the idea of bringing in the wider community and using your own networks. It's the best way. Thank you. Steve, did you want to come in? Well, just to echo the previous point about stakeholder engagement just being a golden thread that runs through through this, you know, they actually bring in, bring in parents, uh, pupils, staff, and indeed the wider community with us on this journey is, is, is so important. But I, if I understand the question correctly, it's about, you know, utilising the, you know, what the people we have around the table. Uh, and, you know, I, I think I, I, the, 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 What's behind the question? I absolutely agree with, which is you know the, the fundamentally understanding uh, the, the the skills and the knowledge that you that you that you have on your board and making best use of that in terms of how you you know deploy governors and trustees in certain roles, for example, or in on, on certain committees. But wider than that, I think what that question is is demonstrating to me is just the importance of having a diverse uh, governing board. Um, so we don't just view um, the boards through the through the lens of the you know certain skills, financial, HR, legal, you know the traditional ones, but but we look more widely to what you know what we want to achieve for our pupils and our communities, and how people's lived experience can bring insight and and, and clarity of thought uh, in in those areas. Um, I, I, I don't come from a teaching background. I've worked in schools all my life um, and, and supporting schools, but I've all, always found that to be a considerable advantage, both as a governor and, and as in, in, my, in my support roles, because what it does is it gives me the opportunity to perhaps stay out of the weeds, like I was saying earlier, but explore and ask questions uh, in, in a, well, dare I say, a naive way, that perhaps others who are, uh, who are you know more closely connected don't. So I think that's just trying to say we all we all have something to bring. So let, you know don't don't sort of um, be constrained by a preconceived notion of what a board needs to look like because we're missing out potentially on those experiences and opportunities to to really you know imagine a better future for our um, children and young people and achieve that through a curriculum. Yeah, absolutely, and I think. That links quite nicely into the cultural, cultural conversation, which I know, Sophie, you touched on. Um, having that diversity around your board uh, board table can, can have a, a great impact on that, I think. Um, obviously, cultural capital is in the Ofsted framework, and it's something that, that is probably what we're all talking about. Um, how can schools navigate it, though, and, and what should governors know about cultural capital in particular? Can I come to you, Adrian? Yeah. Um... Sophie made a really great point earlier um, about cultural capital and but who's cultural capital mm -hmm. and I think that that again building on what Steve said is a really really important point this has to be a done with and not a done to process we're, we're not we're not here to save people and, and have that sort of um 
savior complex we're, we're here to help enrich the lives of young people and sometimes that happens by them enriching our lives with some of their experiences and their cultural identity and that is a, just central to everything for me so thinking about the diversity thinking about what do we have what in terms of the different cultures in our schools in 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 our wider community how can we embrace that how can we celebrate that um going back to our values and thinking about how do we celebrate those and develop those and give some opportunities that might just spark some curiosity and and creativity in our young people to go out and change the world because we don't know what those experiences might spark for them in the future so i think it's a really interesting concept and i'm not, and i'm aware that i haven't actually really given an answer there but just widened the discussion tony did you want to come in yeah i was saying we've done quite a lot of uh, mm. looking at cultural capital because i think it's the definition of what cultural capital is i've said i've put this in the framework it's a little bit woolly how's it quantifiable um we, the, the description we've come up with is basically the sort of the assets, the knowledge, the behaviours, the skills you can help students develop to not only their own culture, it's their own, must more their own culture, their own person as how and how they reflect in the world to make them successful. It's all about eradicating inequalities. If you give those students enough opportunities to develop their own personal skills, their own personal assets, um, which is by, by giving them knowledge, by giving them um, uh, access to develop their skills and letting them develop these behaviors, you're giving them a cultural identity. It's not necessarily a racial, you know, not necessarily cultures that way. I think it's how you stand in society, in your current society, as well as where you stand in the world. Uh, to us, well, to me personally, I think a lot of um, cultural capital is personal, uh, self-confidence, self-identity, why am I going to go in the world? And this is where, where schools should be helping them develop them as a, a holistic person and giving mm -hmm. them the experiences to develop that. It's just exposing them to as much as possible to learn about themselves. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Uh, do you have examples that you've seen, real life examples of, of that schools are sort of implementing that, that you would you thought, wow, that's a really good way of going about it? <laughs> Oh, there, there are so many sort of things. I think, I, th I think a lot of it is um, giving students control of their own learning. And that is a good thing that's come out of the, the pandemic. But so to, to divert, develop their own, but we do, we do a lot of, um, it has to be experiential. You can't learn through somebody telling you, you've got to experience mm -hmm. yourself. Um, and again, we're working globally now. So we're, we're trying to connect schools globally to share cultures and to learn what's going on and just uh, getting peer-to-peer -peer interaction is the best. Look, this is a child in Africa you can talk to. Here's a child in China. Have a conversation. We're, we're trying to enable that at the moment and finding out what's going around the world and showing them, to be honest, it's a small place and we all have the same issues. We all have the same experiences just in different parts of the world. So we, we, we're we trying to enable more um, online projects to begin with. When travel starts, get them out there. Traveling, even just going in your local, you know, get your local areas to visit libraries, mm -hmm. art galleries. Um, it doesn't, need, it doesn't need to even leave the classroom. You can go through Zoom and talk to children in Africa. We've been having some amazing conversations going on at the moment recently, a lot with China, to be honest, and Spain. It's fantastic. So it's not even, so that also is on the funding front, is not prohibitive then. If, if you're doing it by Zoom and you're speaking to somebody in another country, you're not having to send people on planes and trains and exactly. things like that. It needs, it needs to be you know. inclusive and accessible yeah. for the majority, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Even if you find that, okay, you send someone on a trip, they need to be ambassadors to bring back that experience, share it with the school, make sure that what their experiences are shared too. It gives them mm -hmm. confidence with communications and sharing too. There are so many uh, different aspects that you can develop in their skills by giving them the opportunity. We've got some great student council work going on where we have schools joining our student council. They're doing projects and sharing what they've done around the world. Our secondary one has just done a plastic pollution one. The primary one just did, are doing a biodiversity audit of their school grounds. Uh, you know, there's loads of things they can do that don't cost money. <laughs> Lovely. Thank you. That's good to know. Good to know. Um, you mentioned about that holistic aspect and, and somebody did ask um, about a, holistic, a question about the more holistic approach. Um, what would the panel believe this approach should look like and what outcomes would you envisage as markers of its success? What do the panel understand by the term holistic essentially and, and how, do we got, uh, how do we make sure that, that we've got that success? Who would like to come in first on that one? Steve? Yeah, I, I think again, from from a governing perspective, you know, without sort of repeating myself, we ha we we really do 
have this opportunity uh, in, in front of us to see how our pupils and our students are be, you know, in front of our eyes almost become more worldly, um, more resilient, uh, you know, uh, autonomous, generous, you know, have that sense of belonging and all that, that, those things. Um, but in terms of how we approach it strategically as governing boards, when, I think when I'm having conversations about the curriculum with colleagues, um, rather than talk, rather than you know talk about uh, so much about progress and, and achievement, which there's a place for that in our conversations. I really want to tease out how our pupils are gaining knowledge and life skills, whether that's through, you know, uh, PHSE education, how their physical literacy is, is uh, taken care of and being uh, encouraged, um, where they're getting those rich experiences from, it, it, whether it's through performance practice, whether it's through visits outside of school, whether it's through volunteering or fundraising themselves, um, and how they are um, getting to grips with, with the challenges that you know this tough old world presents, you know, globally and and locally. Some of the things Tony was just mentioning, and and also something that's very close to my heart as well, um, especially right now, you know, in the twenty first century, ensuring that they, you know, they are uh, properly prepared for the jobs of of, of tomorrow. So they they're you know they have the opportunity to make good choices and be successful in whatever career they choose to pursue. So. Uh, career, careers education is such an important aspect of of of, of giving you know empowering pupils in this in this way and and, and for primary those who govern in primary as well you know I don't think it's a secondary thing it's no. something we should be really uh, you know doing to help our pupils uh, think about you know how the, you know what they want to do and and what they genuinely can achieve and not be pigeonholed it you know by you know sort of way in the ways that society does sometimes yep. do that thank you adrian did i see you wanted to come in there yeah um steve's just just laid the platform out perfectly the <laughs> whole holistic education is, is about unfortunately we have a, an education system that is very narrowly driven and focused on exam results and in, in, in a system that writes off uh, approximately a third of our young people every year by them not getting the good pass grades that um, that are a uh, strive a stride for. So we have to do something different, and we have to celebrate what is important. And to me, as an educator, first, what's the most important thing is that when uh, when children and students leave, you know, our care that they're able to flourish out there in society. And I know that we've done our job if when in five years time, those, those young people come back to us and they're being successful in whatever environment it is that they're in. Mm. I can talk to you about some of the, the most inspirational young people who left school with very little in terms of qualification one I'm thinking of in particular, he now has four multi-million pound businesses, but that comes down to the fact of the skills and the determination and the character that he built in school to understand who he was and what he was good at. And, and you know, he picks up on all the things that, that the panelists have been saying. So what Tony was saying about understanding who you are, what you like, what is your passion. That's what school's about. That's what a holistic education is about. And that's what matters. How do we get to that? How do we measure? We, you know, what I would love to see is something along the lines of a, a baccalaureate that celebrates, this is what I do in terms of academics and I'm really good at these things and I've got these grades. However, this is who I am as a person. These are the things that I develop. This is the experiences that have shaped who I am and where I want to go next in my journey. That's what I would love to see next. Thank you. And one of the things that John, uh, well, the question that he was talking about the International Baccalaureate, so that, that close link by adding to it. Tony, sorry. Yeah, I was just saying that the, by definition to me, holistic is the whole child. It's not just the academic, like say, it, we're not, shouldn't be driven by exam results because that mm -hmm. is not everybody. To me, holistically is looking at 
it, like I say, personal, it's, it's your social aspect, your social skills, your physical, your spiritual, and your moral. And like I say, it's like I say, it's the well being. Resilience is the biggest word out there. Coping with change, we've just had to, they've just had to cope with two years of totally different uh, world out there. Just teaching them resilience and self confidence. You can't go wrong with self confidence. So it's a matter of celebrating aging. So, right, it's celebrating things that are not necessarily exam results. Having things in place that they can be rewarded and celebrated and share the things that are not just academic. It's more about them and give them a chance to shine in that. Uh, there are various ways you can do that. I couldn't, you know, specifically go, but like I say, holistic is the whole child as well. Absolutely. So, so thinking about that development of the whole child and also the fact that we're going to have careers that we don't even know about at the moment uh, in the future. What sort of que what questions would you would you be asking as governors? What what questions should be asking our leaders to make sure that they are keeping that sort of front and centre. Any top tips? So thank you. Yeah, so I think I would be asked, I mean, every school that I've come across um, has its school values um, mm -hmm. and different schools use these in different ways. It can be anything from words written on the wall to things that are really lived and breathed in school. And so I would be asking, how are you, in, how are you reinforcing your values within your school? How are you supporting students to develop those values we don't want to be measuring them against something that we're not supporting them to develop does every child in your school understand what those values mean um self-confidence something that's been mentioned a lot and personally i think that is up there with the most important things that any young person or adult can possess but i think with a lot of the language that we use around these kind of essential skills there's i think there'll be a lot of misunderstanding with resilience with confidence being a confident young person doesn't mean you're the loudest person in the room there are loads of different ways you can express confidence and so I think it's about supporting young people to really understand what these words mean and to be able to more accurately reflect on themselves against some of these values um, similarly with resilience resilience doesn't mean just keeping trying at something if it's all going terribly wrong it's about reaching out for support and help when you need it and so it's all of those things so i would be kind of questioning um staff and students um around what those values mean to them and how they're really embedded within the curriculum not just pshe or as an aside how they are lived and breathed every day in school Thanks, Sophie. What I'm hearing is that a lot of this we're going to need to see as governors, not just through our full governing board meeting, but also through speaking to staff and students and, and having those monitoring visits and conversations with people on the ground and, and really hearing how they're feeling about it so that we get that triangulation of um, of, of how how it's going. Uh, any, Adrian, did you want to come in on that one? Yeah, just, just to, uh, again, to build on what Sophie said with a real tangible example, the school where I'm governor at, we have our, our, our shine values and that, that that's an acronym for success happy included nurtured and enriched and that's all the questions that we ask how do how do we know that our children are successful and success can be relative to wherever they are on their level so everything we talk about we're talking about from that angle mm -hmm. how do we know that our children are happy how do we know that the staff are happy those are the questions so we, we run all the way through that how do we know that everybody's included so we, we look at it through those different lenses. How do we nurture our staff to be the best that they can be so that they can do that for the children? How do we make sure that everybody's enriched? So it's about the questions that you ask. And we, we like Sophie just said, we run that straight through our, our core values of the school. Um, so that's how we keep it right at the center. Everything that we do is about those values. Um, and that leads into the vision, that leads into the mission, and that leads into our priorities. So we make sure that that is central to all of that uh, and it keeps us really focused. If it isn't happening in those values and it's not, if we're not looking at why, what, uh, whether people are successful, whether they're happy and included and so on, why, why are we doing it? That's what we do as a governing board. We've taken that route. So hopefully that's, that's music to somebody's ears uh, and inspiration for them. Excellent, thank you. Um, are there any things that people, that governing boards can think about, about their, the way they set up their governing boards that might help uh, governing boards to monitor what's going on in this area? Is, I mean, we have linked governors for other things, but is, are there other ways of doing that, Steve? Uh, well, yeah, can I say about something about that generally? Yeah. Because I think um, 
there there are uh, traditional and well established ways, aren't there, of monitoring school mm. performance? And you've just mentioned them, haven't you? You know, can we, yeah. uh, you know, it's it's necessary to delegate the, the considerable workload that boards have, but it's also seen as a way of being more forensic and getting under the weeds by, you know, by dedicating a committee's responsibility or a, and. Those, those as um, principles work fine. I think actually, you know, I think ha mm -hmm. having, having, a, having a committee focus on this, having a link governor focus on this is, is absolutely right. What I would say though, is that we have to be smart about the way that we, um, uh, the way that we deploy these responsibilities. Um, and I think there are still too many boards and I think the accountability system, you know, Adrian's mentioned this, is, is, is partly responsible for this. It pushes us in a certain direction. So I think too many boards take like a formulaic approach to, to having linked governors for, you know, literacy, numeracy, or whatever it might be, or, or, or certain. And, and I think what, what I would do actually, or any advice I would give to a governing board who's thinking about how they monitor this, is actually, you know, it sounds a little bit like boring because we keep repeating this, but go back to those first principles, what you're actually looking to achieve you know what 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 your areas are uh, that you that you will turbocharge your vision and, and then build mon build a monitoring system around that build a monitoring system around your strategic priorities rather than traditional areas for curriculum monitoring and, and, and outcomes because i think if you're across those strategic priorities your strategy is right those 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 other areas will take care of themselves so i think that's really important not to be too um restricted in your thinking about how you allocate link governor roles here so you know if you have a I have a, a governor re responsible for link for curriculum enrichment think about you know actually what that means in your context and and how that person can add value and uh, and drive board discussions thank you definitely something to review um linking back into the character uh, character development and soft skills aspect and I, I guess thinking also about um whether that might be on school development plans and and sort of thinking about that for the next year I think with the return after after hopefully after COVID you know the children being embedded back into schools I think a lot of schools have been thinking about the development of, of their pupils um probably more so now than ever before um is there anything that we should be watching out for on the character development side and soft skills any particular soft skills that you think maybe schools are missing on or or really are key that we should be thinking about as, as governors and, and sort of trying to monitor Sophie did you want to come in I'd have to come in and um, I think schools are doing I think schools probably understand themselves which skills their young people need to support so I have my own personal views but I don't think it's my place to tell a school which um yeah which kind of things they need to work on with their young people what I can say I'm really hearing from a lot of schools at the moment um confidence and resilience are massively coming out um Tony mentioned resilience earlier I think for a lot of young people, the last couple of years have been you know, incredibly challenging, but every young person's had a really different experience over the last couple of years. Um, and although a lot of resilience has been shown by everybody um, to get through these couple of years, um, it's been resilience in quite a different way. Um, young people maybe haven't had the same interactions with you know, friendships and all the challenges that come as a result of that. And so I know a lot of schools are seeing kind of more challenges in the relationships that young people have with each other at the moment. Um, and then with confidence, I know a lot of young people are feeling more anxious than before. There's, you know, a whole host of mental health challenges that schools are seeing. So I think some of those, you know, the some of the basics of those essential skills, I think, are so important. Um, and yeah, if confidence and resilience aren't on your school's agenda. I imagine they are for nearly every school at the moment. I don't I haven't spoken to a teacher who's not thinking about those things. But um, from my personal perspective, those should really be up there in the conversation. Thank you. It's that aspect of, of coming coming back to school after COVID. Um, everybody missed out on a lot of things, as you said. It wasn't it wasn't just one one group. Lots of children missed out, and I guess there's a lot of children who haven't been to a museum or haven't been to an art gallery. All of those sort of things that fit very neatly under cultural the traditional view of cultural capital. Um, are you seeing schools starting to do those things again now? Is, is that happening? Is, is that what you're witnessing, Adrian? Is that happening in your schools? Are we yeah, back, back to where we were? 
Well, I'd say we're, we're a long way from where we were um, mm -hmm. for, for a number of reasons. But to, to add on to, to the, the sort of the, the character and um, traits that, that Sophie said of, of confidence uh, and resilience, I'd, I'd like to add the one of empathy. And I think that lots of schools, leaders, adults in, in school buildings and, and also parents need to have a, a degree of empathy for what everybody has been through. Everybody's mm -hmm. experience has been different and we can't, you know, make, you know, can't look at the things through the same lens for everyone. Um, some people's have been, you know, significantly worse than, than others and we need to be understanding of that. Uh, and when I think about it from a, a, a child-centered point of view, for two years, our children have been told, you're behind, you're missing out, you haven't done this, we've got to catch up. Mm -hmm. that, is a, that is an extremely damaging message to them so we have to be empathetic to where they are of course they're going to be feeling anxious of, of course they're going to be nervous that oh, i've missed something I, I, i'm not where i should be um and when you've got seven year olds who are just doing their key stage one sats and that's the kind of feeling that they have that's not right they their whole start to school has been not in the normal vein so we have to think about things in a different way so all those character traits are really, really really important to, to develop but the aspect of that is going to be led by your school community we can't there is no one size fits all it's going to be about what is required for your school your school community um because if it was that easy we would have cracked it by now yeah <laughs> so that that's that's the first and foremost one but i think I, I, the second one that i want to highlight is getting our young people to be curious again making sure that we foster that element of curiosity because that curiosity leads to them being innovative, leads to them being independent. That's what we want our young people to be. So where can we do those things? Second point, to go back to your question, Hannah, about are we getting back to those things? Yes, we're starting to get back to them um, and people are having confidence to be able to go out. You know, the, the vast majority of um, illness and, and absence is is fading away it's still there in some communities and in some areas but it's it's starting to fade away and people are starting to venture back out um, but that leads back to what i said about the the empathy aspect there are a lot of adults and school leaders who are on their knees and that they are you know running on fumes trying to get to the end of the year and um, so we need to be really sort of mindful around all of those things and, and get into that rebuilding and resetting so rebuilding learning it's not going to happen overnight those things are, are going to take time we need to understand the implications of what's happened over the last two years and how that's left people feeling we need to reset some of our expectations and start again so it's a it's a whole very complex system to, to get to but one that i'm confident that as we go into 2023 people will, will gain their confidence and be doing more of that. Yeah, I think there's, there's still quite a lot of underlying anxiety um, with trips and things like that. You know, parents, A, their children potentially have, have are coming to trips much later in their, they won't have maybe stayed away from home and things like that if they're, they're going away because of, because of COVID. And I think just general anxiety around being in public spaces, is, there's still a, an aspect of that as well. We're nearly at the end. I would like to come to each of you if there's a final point that you would like to make, something that you think governors should take away um, to share with their governing boards and, and to ask the senior leaders, something like that. Uh, so, Tony, can I come to you first, please? Oh, I, I think, like I say, the, the, the overarching thing is basically uh, speak out, <laughs> offer your help, <laughs> be, find out what's going on in your school and how you can, can contribute based on those, those amazing skills and, and, and talents that we've already got in, our, in the Board of Governors. Yeah, just say, you know, offer your help, even if uh, you don't think it works, you'll be, you'll be surprised how many teachers will grab at it. So oh, actually, yes, I'll you please have contact me with that or you know what I mean. So speak out, um, work together, have a united vision um, and be part of the school because you know your school best. Every school has its own different, different little tweaks. <laughs> Lovely. Thank you. Steve, can I come to you second? Very, very difficult to to top that. Uh, <laughs> agree, agree, agree entirely. I, I think absolutely. Don't don't underestimate the power and influence we have. I, I said that earlier. Um, make the most of the wonderful privilege it is to 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 
be in school from time to time and, and, and experience that and talk to pupils, staff, stakeholders, uh, the wider community, that is, a, is an immense privilege. That, that, that's, a, that's the second thing. And, you know, as everyone has said, just have a clear vision for what you want your pupils to leave school knowing and being, stick mm -hmm. to it and, and, and build, you know, build your strategy around that. Uh, and and be compassionate, as Adrian said. That's so important. You know, I think COVID's demonstrated that, hasn't it? Like, you know, the deep humanity and compassion that's in our schools is just, you know, uh, it, it, you know, it, it, I'm in awe of it. I really am. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Adrian, can I come to you next? Yeah, um, it's very it's very difficult to <laughs> talk what, what, what Tony and then and then Steve has, have said. So. Um, I'll just echo really what Steve said and put it in, in, in a couple of sentences of go back to your why. Why, why. why does our school exist? Why are you a governor? And what is our school's mission to, to, to achieve? And then start from there and build outwards. Thank you. And to finish off, Sophie. Thanks, Hannah. Um, oh yeah, echo what everyone else has said. Um, I would say celebrate what your school is already doing. Um, teachers have had a tough time, so let's really support and encourage them for all the stuff that they've got going on in schools at the moment. Um, but what you can do, look at how it can be threaded together. Don't need to reinvent the wheel. There's lots of great stuff happening already. Just think about how you can maybe support a bit of joined up thinking around that. Um, and then also I would say think about your disadvantaged young people, your harder to reach young people. How is whatever you've got happening in school really reaching them? How are you making sure all of your students can access whatever enrichment opportunities you're providing? Thank you ever so much. Thank you ever so much to all four of our panellists. It was really wonderful to have you uh, today and really insightful on, on what we've got to take away to our governing boards. And I know I've gone away with lots, going to go away with lots of questions that I, I would, will be posing next week in our next four governing board meeting. Um, I hope everybody enjoyed the webinar. As I said at the beginning, it is being recorded and will be available for you. Um, we will upload it to our website and also send out an email to everybody who has registered. Um, thank you ever so much for joining us and I would like to wish you a lovely afternoon. Thank you. Goodbye. <laughs>